Hi there, thanks for joining us for the executive series. I am joined by Richard White today, the CEO of Wise Tech Global. Richard, I'm always grateful for your time because you are extremely busy, uh, particularly having just reported results. Everyone's eager to talk to you, so thanks for being here. Tom, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Now, I am going to start in a slightly less conventional way you know, in terms of your dividend. Um, so you bumped the dividend up uh, in the last half, but I suppose what stands out to me is that um, since 2017, you have consistently raised your dividend um, at a time when you have to balance so many other priorities in terms of the money that comes into WiseTech, be it research and development, uh, acquisitions, um, but you've um, prioritized increasing the dividend at the same time. So I just want to get your thoughts on you know, where the you know, uh, average investor sits in your thinking when you're making those decisions. Well, first of all, the dividend, we have a dividend policy that says we'll pay up, up to 20% of net profit after tax. And we've been doing that exactly at 20%. And because the company's been growing and because we're very cash positive, that dividend has been paid at the 20% and it's been increasing, the 7.7 .7 cents this, uh, this time around. I think it's responsible for a company to be profitable, to be cash positive and to pay a dividend and to up to the other 80% of that profit, we invest wisely in the growth of the company. I think anything else is less than perfect. Now, last time we spoke, we um, had a chat about the gulf that can be, uh, exists between uh, someone like you, a visionary that um, has built an organization from the ground up, and communicating with the analyst community. And I suppose what stands out with your results this half is that you almost silenced the analysts because um, it was almost blemish-free in terms of, of the, the feedback and the, um, the, the ratings changes. Um, how important is it? to communicate a vision that is as expansive as yours to the average person who perhaps might not be you know, intuitively familiar with the things you're talking about? Well, look, it's a job that you have to do. And I, I take uh, feedback from, from you and from many other people, and I listen to what people say, and I realised that we had to do a better job of explaining ourselves. Right. And so I actually put, along with my communications team and my investor relations team, we put a lot of effort into this result to simplify it, actually. Right. We took more things out than we put in by a long way. We spent uh, time developing how to do it as a calm, orderly thought process, keeping the message very straightforward and structured, and, and touching on the essentials of why WiseTech is the company that it is and why it's growing and where it's going to be, the, the, the operating system for global logistics. I think the, the key here was making it digestible and not trying to force you know a hundred pieces of information into the into the pipe so that's a, a key phrase that you've used before becoming the uh, operating system of choice for, for global logistics so um, in your pack you spoke about the position that you occupy in terms of the top 25 freight forwarders mm. right so you you've got about half of them um, there so it's yeah. Um, so I'm curious as to where is that tipping point? Where do you see that tipping point in terms of becoming the apple for this group, the the operating system that they cha just can't go past uh, in terms of uh, all of the benefits that you bring? Well, first of all, I think we'd be have to be very respectful because this has been a long term build and it's taken a lot of effort from ourselves and from customers to build the capability and the credibility of what, what, we, what we're doing. Now, the fact that we've gotten uh, Sinotrans, which is a very yep. big Chinese um, logistic company, and that's the 13th, which is more than t more than half of the 25. So it does feel like we're on the downhill run now, yep. sort of over the top of the hump. Right. Um, and there's also some evidence, if you look at slide 21 in the deck, that we've got you know, a very strongly supportive capability here where our customers are growing whereas the remainder are not growing. And that's pretty good uh, fact set. There's there's lots of different facts that, that point to that. The other one that I, I probably think is more, more real and more future focused is the uh, incredible result we've been, the incredible efficiency of our development, uh, product development, and how much we've been spending and how much we're going to spend. You think in the last five years, more than a billion dollars in R&D, and on the forward basis, you look just this year alone, it's about 360, 370 million R&D. 
And that's a growing number. It's a, it's a percentage of revenue and it'll continue to tick up as we grow, which we're doing quite well. And the other, th- inside the business, we've been spending enormous amounts of effort uh, really figuring out how to maximize the yield out of that development. And you can see that in the capitalized development ratio. We're getting more new product built and spending less time because there are less bugs, fixing bugs. Yep. And that means that our dollar in comes out much higher. Maybe it's 3 or $4 out comparatively. I mean, a lot of companies that I've got direct experience with spend about 90% of their R&D budget fixing bugs and about 10% building new product. We're 54% new product that's extraordinarily efficient comparatively so that dollar in and going forward that dollar in is going to become even more efficient and larger that's where the competitive edge is going to become most most important and obviously that's quite compelling for uh, a customer who sees these efficiencies in terms of going well it's hard to go past cargo wise as a as a platform but um i mean the other side of that coin is that uh you have uh, almost uh, set off uh, a new way of thinking when it comes to uh, this landscape. Are there risks that um, someone's going to just dive into the pool and say, okay, we're going to challenge uh, what uh, Wise Tech has done in terms of uh, we can still gain critical mass in, in this landscape and, and challenge what, what uh, Richard's up to? There's always a competitor somewhere. And I think what you have to do is, I mean, it's very hard to measure a competitor because you don't know their internal statistics, you don't understand their culture, you don't really know how successful they are, what they're doing. What you can measure is what you're doing yourself. And if we consistently and continuously work on improving ourselves deeply, um, we will become better and better. And I think at the scale that we're at, we're now the largest logistics software company in the world. And I still think there's an enormous amount of growth that we can do. And and that growth can be incredibly efficient and productive growth. So I think the, the my message to my team is always try to be better than yourself because you can't measure your competitors and you don't know yeah. what's going to happen in that space. If you are better and better, it makes it very hard for a competitor to enter because you're just doing everything you're supposed to do as a, as a supplier. The 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 one thing that's happened uh, this this uh, release is we spent quite a bit of time talking about. AI, generative AI particularly, and try to frame that in what we've been doing for the last 10 years in machine learning, big data, and general automation of the system to make people more efficient, and throwing that other layer of Gen AI on top of it. In fact, we, uh, we, I published uh, avatars of Andrew and myself talking to the results. Uh, all of them are Gen AI, that's not, that's not the real us, that, yep. that's, uh, but in five languages as well. So, you know, incredibly powerful message that you can do things we could never do before and that leads to further and further productivity which seems like a novelty but in the case of wise tech you know your um, organization spans so many different jurisdictions being able to understand a conversation in a native tongue could actually mean a lot to the people that, that work in those jurisdictions well it's there's there's multiple audiences in fact and and maybe 70 percent of the people sitting in front of our software in logistics don't speak english as a first language uh, our staff, of course, we're in 30 locations and we have a, 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 a ro- wide diaspora of different languages. And it's very helpful to be able to talk to them in, a, in their own language. It simplifies the message and that means the translations can be done much more effectively. Better communications, better connection. We also have customers in Latin America, in Europe, and many other places where the language is a barrier. And so you break that barrier as well. But it's important to think of this technology breakthrough is not just about translating, not just about avatars, not just about machine learning. It's about all the things you can do. You can make your staff more efficient building software. You can make your management better by helping them with with, uh, tools around the AI and Copilot and ChatGPT. You can make training systems for our staff much better, for our customers much better, for the academy where we train people on industry practices. All of those can be made better. There's so many things you can do with Gen AI and machine learning and big data. This is just a lot of fun. I mean, I'm um, curious about the premium that has been established for US tech companies because of AI. It's it's been so much talked about. But clearly, you know, the uh, opportunity for wise tech with AI is immense. Um, and where where is that point in time where you see that all coming together in a very powerful way? 
as a technologist, I've always had um, a bad reaction to try to predict more than three to five years out. You know, right. it's very difficult to predict the long, long-term technology. Hard, hard learnt lessons. Yeah. yeah, it's it's better. I mean, a year ago when AI became a really hot thing, we said very little. We just sort of sat on it and thought, we're going to work that through, and we're going to not just babble about AI and get into the hype cycle. It's much better to apply it to the business, to think through how it can uh, manifestly help our business itself, help our customers, and help the world doing clever things, applying it to the right places in the right ways, and being mature about how to do that. And so this, this result... We said, well, we've done quite a bit of work here. We just want to tell you about a little bit of what we've done. And here's an example of what we've done. Yeah. I think that's the way to do it. You you have to take, I can probably pick two to three years out. Yeah. And I can have a wild guess at five to 10 years, but yeah. I'm, I'm going to be wildly wrong. <laughs> I mean, three years ago, would anybody have picked AI to turn to what it is today? Yeah, exactly. It's been spoken about for so long, and then all of a sudden, it seemed to be you know a everything. five minute window, and everything uh, taken off. So, uh, let's talk about the land side of things um, because uh, the recent acquisition of Matchbox seems like a small one, but in terms of what it represents as again something where you can optimize things, I'm just curious as to how you might scale something this uh, like this under the Wise Tech umbrella. Well, let's explain what Matchbox does first. It takes an import container. Uh, as it gets unpacked, it has to be dehyded and normally gets returned uh, to a fairly long journey back to a container park or a port for reassignment to an export. And then that export gets picked up as an empty container and taken back and filled and then taken back to the port. So there's a lot of movements. A lot of, there's four movements at least. And there's the expense of the container park and reusing the container, cleaning it, stacking time. it, time, gate in, gate out, so forth and so on. Matchbox makes that two, two and a half journeys instead of four. So there's these dead so legs. That's just yeah. that, like you're, you're almost halving the, the almost seven halving. movements, which is a massive uh, productivity Correct. improvement. But the way to do that isn't... Matchbox has done a very good job of that, but what we have is data at scale. Yeah. Our big data part, I can identify all the opportunities to do that work. So there's lots of things you can do in this port community to optimize container movements. They are very expensive. And these dead legs, the legs where the container is running empty, or even the truck is running empty uh, with no container at all, are very expensive for the community. So getting rid of those is a massive improvement. And whilst Matchbox is a small acquisition, the application to WiseTech and its landside logistics strategy is a very big thing. Uh, how are Invase and Bloom going in terms of um, bolting, or, you know, binding them onto the, the bigger group? Uh, quite well. I mean, in fact, uh, a, a number of the things that we had envisioned when we took over Invase and Bloom have been made very, very sophisticated in terms of our thinking and approach going forward. So uh, I think a lot of people look at those side of acquis- sort of acquisitions and think of them as a, as a bolt-on, you know, something that you're going to just continue to run as that business. We literally never do that. 47 acquisitions to date. We have always, always planned to replace the software with something materially better and have it integrated into our core stack. Now that might take three years, five years, even 10 years in some cases, and some of the software's perfectly fine to stay in place. But the big thing is to make the platform that is cargo-wise so much better and so much more efficient. And what Bloom and Invasa give us is another couple of fairly substantial lever points in domestic container transport and in these uh, multimodal containers which go on rail. And that's big for the US, big for Canada, and of course big for the world when we push it globally. Richard, it never seems like we've got enough time to talk, but we started out um, speaking about uh, what the last result means for the average mum and dad investor with the bump up in dividends. So I suppose, uh, what would you say to uh, the average investor, uh, not only in the context of the results that you've just announced, but uh, in terms of where you're thinking over the course of the, the next couple of years uh, and, and what you're um, hoping for in terms of where WiseTech is? A very simple message that I'm putting forward is this. Where we stand now, we are much stronger than we were at the end of the last four years. That's just six months ago. And when you look at where we were then, we were much stronger than we were two years before then. 
this company is progressing forward in a very steady, sophisticated way. We, we don't lose our head. We learn from mistakes. For, for us, every day is a school day. Right? Right. And the, the way that you think of this is that there is so much to do and so much market to penetrate and so many opportunities to do things. We just have to keep our head, keep focusing on what we're good at and making that good even better. Richard, I always feel like I learned something when I speak to you. So for that, I'm grateful and I'm sure our viewers uh, think the same. So thanks very much for your time today. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, and thanks very much for joining us for the Executive Series. <laughs>